first of all, I uh, say um, uh, I was just filled with like a lot of gratitude for the manaki, uh, from the Manafunua and also the, the Fano here or the family here at Donkey Mill making this all happen. Joey and Nancy for luck the collection. And um, also uh, Ed, be keeping your eye on my brother. I've been talking at night time. But then I've sort of been overwhelmed just uh, for the last few days. We've, as you see on the wall over here, we've got the Tamariki's uh, Mahi Law, their work that they've revealed and responded to the photographs. And in saying that, um, what you're looking through here tonight is no different to the photo album that I'm going to show you that I'm going to dust off because I had a bit of a, a moment realizing actually I'm dusting off my photo album, really realizing my age and actually how much of a journey I've gone through as their age. And uh, my first language is actually um, art for a very good reason for my mental well being. Um, I couldn't read or write or talk properly, so I went to a special school. So art was uh, my sanctuary, uh, my go-to place. And um, the reason why we've got these th these three images up here is what we call a maunga, or the mountains, actually. Um, Kikarangi is Norotunga, uh, that's in the Cook Islands. And down below we have uh, Mount Taranaki, which is in uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand in the North Island. And so why I've got those two moments there because they spoke to me as a child and as an adult. And it's taken me on this journey. And every time I sort of get homesick, um, I sort of think of those moments. They have guided me. Um, the special hook that's here is actually from my, um, from my father's side, my biological father's side, which is from a marae kura uh, tatuatea or um, in a uh, raiatea, which is in... I don't like using that word French Polynesia. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to dust the album off. I'm going to start my journey. So we're now in the island of Samoa. That's where my mum's from. So my background is pretty much what I've sort of spent my whole life exploring. And I come from a really interesting um, family where it's like, it was like, literally like a hotel. My father, did, my feeding father, who brought me out was Dennis Tupper. That's where I get my last name from. He was at a painting attorney. So we had always interesting people visiting our house. And why I said there's five brothers, plus the three cousins, plus the rest of the suburb that were living at our house. So our house was constantly transiting three or four languages, different personalities. And this, um, this one here is uh, this shot was taken in Samoa and looked at Ma. Um, at our school, um, I came fascinated, fascinated with uh, tatouage or the Samoan pair. Now, it's not something that you receive like lightly. It's a, it's the next step in life. And I first saw this uh, tat, uh, tatau uh, actually at, at a wedding. And this guy had taken his top off when we were having the, uh, at a wedding. And as a young child, went out there and I couldn't believe what, what these things were. So I, when I went to art school, I went to a fairly interesting, uh, there was only like two Pacific Islanders at the art school, a couple of Maori students there. So I spent the next three years just getting to know myself uh, and away from home um, because of the five brothers, it was a chance to get to know myself. So basically these are um, prints on tapa. This is back, and I'm showing my age here, uh, in 1986. Uh, so as I went on um, my journey, like exploring um, different, uh, these are not just patterns. I mean, these are actually have a meaning behind it. It's like the weaving system that's around it. It's like talking about weaving the whanau together or the family together. Uh, talking about the seven canoes, uh, that sort of journey to Aotearoa. So... at art school, so thank God. But I was, uh, my art was actually taking me on that journey. My first love, 
um, it's like my visual diary. Um, I'm always uh, changing and exploring because I like to cha challenge myself. I don't want to know about it. That's the whole part of the journey as we were with these students for the last two and a half days. As you can see, there's rugby players. There's, yes, that is my first religion. And then also I commentate. I use uh, wood cutting as another way to actually get my, my ideas across to the audience or it's just a vehicle. So mainly now where I'm at at this age, the art has been an amazing vehicle just to get the ideas across or what I'm thinking. Um, you see the uh, Tibai Vai, it's a response because my cousins are actually black pill divers near where the nuclear testing was happening yeah, near Mororo. So I dedicated this, this, uh, this print to uh, my cousins because I actually I had an uncle who suffered from the fallout. So, oh. and again, and these, you'll see the images, they are all linked up. And all I had in my backpack when I was going around the South Pacific while I was at art school, um, they didn't teach Pacific, uh, Pacific uh, Island art or Māori art. So I, I, I challenged the art history teachers. So what I did is I went to the, um, the islands, uh, like Samoa, Tokelau, the Cook Islands, and I did a lot of voluntary teaching, but then also research. And the deal was to bring that information and actually empower the students uh, with the, uh, the material uh, that I was interviewing with the elders. Because honestly, we didn't actually have any such thing as like Maori art or Pacific Island art from our background. Uh, this is at the Marae at uh, Raiatia. And these were like, um, I had a whole bunch of rolls of paper that I always do like these drawings in response when I was interviewing the elders. I uh, know those are. Uh, color pencil. Uh, just all pencil. Light and paper. All I would as I was saying, the written language is not really my first language. Mm. So when I came back from Tahiti and the Cook Islands, um, most of my cousins. Uh, don't work, they, their belief is looking after the whenua. Uh, they believe that uh, they uh, look after the land or the plantations. And also we have this amazing uh, event that happens just after Bastille in Fresh Polynesia called the Hiva. So we have comp dance competitions, uh, the canoe competitions, all the traditional sports. So after living in Tahiti, I made my way, my journey way back to uh, Aotearoa to New Zealand, and I met my wife Jane, and she had introduced me to the, uh, the uh, International Festival of the Arts, and then I basically was doing these responses, bringing all these images. Now that was a dark time because uh, tattoo or tattooing was actually still quite in the dark because it was related to the gang related, and I wanted to change that. Um, the bovies or these big gigantic these um, are. Uh, super, they're actually life-size balls that I made a uh, what we call corned beef tins, or you uh, equivalent to your spam. It is. It was. It was used in a, a, in a major exhibition called I Dream of Joseph, and uh, I mean um, Bottle Ocean with Jim Viviade, and it was in response to the diabetes, what this animal would actually have done destructively on the island, and that what our food, uh, what our people were actually eating a lot of processed food. So I don't eat meat for that very reason in response to that, because um, like, for example, in Samoa, 60% of the women with diabetes. Diabetes is one of the main killers in our, in our race, basically, in Polynesia. It's processed meat, processed food. So I use these as just vehicles to actually get everyone talking about what we are consuming. Because I think a lot of students still today, back at home in Aotearoa, are, still get confused that I'm a vegetarian. Um, these balls, uh, one of them, uh, there's got a barbecue inside, they're mechanical, they walk by themselves. Uh, they have, uh, we put food inside them so you can smell them coming, uh, coming in head. Uh, we use them for, for performances. Um, they were first made in the first series uh, for the Wellington City Art Gallery. I was supposed to do a whole lot of woodcuts. This is what I was well known for my woodcuts. 
but what it's, what I did instead was make a whole lot of tiny pipi or um, these big gigantic mechanical balls. And then what I did is two uh, dance groups together, uh, the diaspora that live in, uh, in New Zealand, and New Zealand are uh, also Samoans on the other side, or Pacific Islands on the other side. And what we basically did is I um, had these cannons placed all around the top of the buildings because at that time in the 90s, a lot of our people uh, were still shy of actually going into the institutional or the art galleries. So this is actually a first time or finding a way to get our people to come into the galleries and have that conversation about the food that we're consuming and what are these animals that we have. I grew up with bulls because um, as you saw that mountain, uh, Mount Taranaki on a farm, um, Pete Cowley, last name is a dairy farmer, but also a bull breeder. So I was already familiar with the shape as a child. So the reason why I built them uh, life size is because as you remember as a young child, we looking at the scale of it. So I was trying to plant the seeds uh, in the young ones. Uh, this is a, my very first performance piece. Uh, this is where I had a big fallout with the city gallery where they wouldn't let our people um, be fed inside the gallery. So what I did is, as you know, we know the security guards. They knew another space across the road. And what we did is I got my family to put the barbecues all along the uh, in front of the gallery. And basically we had two big, huge uh, dance groups coming to me to convert towards the gallery. They marched the balls through the street. The theatre and the art is out in the street. So uh, it was very good. That's... <laughs> And then basically what it was happening is uh, with the, the, uh, the buses, the, my audience that I was going for were the people going home. So we timed it uh, around about five o'clock. So we caused huge traffic jam. And that was the whole point of the exercise. Um, they were beautifully all sculpted. And then basically before they went into the gallery, um, we did a deal where we actually um, smashed the balls up before they went in. So it was a whole... The whole idea is just to put a memory in that person's head space. So these these performances went on, uh, and this is showing my age again. This is all happening in the nineties. Um, I did these uh, performances over in Australia. Um, they went over to New York. Um, they were uh, all up and down the country in Aotearoa, and basically. It was just that I was looking for ways, how do I bring my community as part of the art piece? And how do we have a chat or a, a way to actually communicate with the, uh, the audience? But we, what we wanted them to do was do uh, the audience sitting in the bus, just take that bus. Did you see that? <laughs> and having that conversation at the table. I mean, this is before the um, the internet was really going off at that yes, time. Yeah. So this is <laughs> at that stage. We filled them up with fireworks. We'd I, always uh, paddle beat the, um, the actual bulls themselves. But basically what we did was we smashed them up and then I panel beat them and put them all back together again. <laughs> they were, um, they, they, this series went on for a while because it was, it was done before health and safety in New Zealand. We had to, uh, so I had to stop doing these performance pieces because the um, I had to take a huge insurance because of all the, the fire hazards that we were doing. And basically, also, just it was actually quite dangerous. But at the same time, at the same time, it just gave the young ones a memory. And when um, also we had this uh, famous dance, if you've ever been to Samoa, the fires at what we call the Siva Afi. So it just gave our chance, our community to feel good that they could be part of their institution, that they could feel relaxed going into the gallery. So we were trying to provide a space for them. This is in Australia at the APT. Now, as you look closely at the labels, what I did was go around repatriating the landscape. So I started painting on all the labels. I started creating all these, um, grabbing the labels and repatriating it by talking about the devastation of this animal, this four-legged animal. And basically um, what I did is I did these um, performance pieces where uh, this is in Australia, as you can see the young guys, uh, we took over a house, we parked livestock uh, inside a house, the kids playing the PlayStation. The reason why, <laughs> this is in Australia, 
uh, one of the Aboriginal caves, it's like a sitting room, was the very first image of the bull that arrived in Australia on the first 11 ships. And that cave was destroyed. And so that was like a response about like trying to take ownership. And so it would collaborate with the locals. So my art is just a way for me to, how do we get the community involved as we've been doing for the last few days? Now, I'm a real passionate uh, person about history. History actually is one of those things. And I, look, and I said I struggled with, um, with my dyslexia, but there was one book called The Trial of the Cannibal Dog by Anne Salmon, Dane Anne Salmon. And George Luca, another artist, passed this book on to me. And it was all about, uh, I won't say it, but Captain Cook's uh, first voyage. And basically what I did is I had to do a, re a response to this um, cave that we were looking for, called Tupaya's Cave, who's actually one of our, our uh, whenua, who is um, our ancestors from the Marae Te He was the guide, uh, the translator, the navigator on Cook's very first voyage. From, he was picked up in Tahiti, and he came down to Aotearoa, and then basically he was the first one to do this very first watercolour. So these hellos or these shapes, these forms, as a response uh, to this cave that the, um, the Tangata Whenua in uh, Uau, Tolika Bay, on the east coast of the North Island. This is where this cave was. And so basically what I did is I did a visual response to the, uh, the transit of Venus. Okay. So I use a lot of mediums, as you see. Oh, there's that guy, uh, Mr. Cookie. <laughs> Because we still have issues with Cook Islander, you know, and he's not my granddad, he's not my father, but the thing is that we have, uh, where we are, there's 15 islands in the Cook Islands, but what we've done, we've changed the spelling to K instead of C, but there's still a lot of talk about repatriating the original name for the Cook Islands. So there's always been this conversation, even though he did not land in Rotonga, but basically what we're doing is still contesting this name. And the beautiful part about what's going on in Aotearoa now is a lot of the names are being given back to the Manapenua. So they're going back to the original names because they make sense, not James Cook. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the uh, places I was talking about. Now we were talking about, you asked me the name for, um, for Dolphin. So up here is actually Tupai's uh, tag. Oti, the uh, warrior dolphin. And so what we, we were doing was we actually were looking where actually um, Tupai had gone with uh, Banksy, Parkinson, uh, James Cook when they arrived. And he, Tupai was the main guy that actually, if they didn't have Tupai on that first voyage, I think it would have been game over for James Cook. Um, basically, uh, this cave here is in a place called uh, Oputama. It's in a valley. Um, and basically, this is just just recently with the Tahitians, we were um, not celebrating, but talking about the time of the landing or the different things that actually happened on that. It's still tense. We still suffer from that trauma. I mean, it was like, like get over it. But no, there's, we're still inheriting those problems where they come from. You can throw as much money as you like at it, but like these photographs, they are a factual uh, fact, but I look at these uh, these site specific like middens. So these are like uh, uh, paintings on tapa, um, talking about the uh, this uh, Waiheke. So if you can imagine, all the different islands right across the Akiwa are like little petrol stations. I call them BP stations. So I've always contested that. Oh, we got there by accident, but no, we've proved that. And the Hokalea. Uncle Heck and Papa Mao have opened up those, uh, those highways. There's a massive renaissance with the navigation and the waffle culture that has started now. They are the new mobile schools, okay? And so now kids, uh, Tamariki can now go on these, um, these vars, but they're not, they're not just learning about celestial uh, navigation. It's talking about working together because this idea is not mine. It comes from behind 
and beside from my own uh, Fano and my friends. And Salmon has been one of my um, uh, like my mentors, and that book had changed my life. I, it's, I, I pushed it because it was each page, each visual image I was responding. So what I spent most of but still to now, still to, uh, responding to uh, some of the texts, the taonga. When I say taonga, these are taonga, like these photographs or the artifacts, like the rocks, like the ads. So when I go to Germany or when I go to Europe, I go into the collections. And when you're holding those um, ads, they are like um, USB sticks. And this is different energy that comes off it. I mean, if you, um, yeah, this is connection. But what I was doing was documenting the uh, the Taiwan that are actually in these collections. And basically, what my mission was, again, going back to those tins, uh, the, the, the responses. So we started to make these documentaries, responding to the paintings, the etchings, because we do those. Those things come uh, a way to actually to respond to. And so these images, like these artifacts that we're seeing here on this wall over here, and these pages that from the past, and now it's a chance for us to actually write the narrative. We're still in the sea. So again, um, again, going back to my historical side, um, this is a commission or called Mark, you know. There used to be a, a settlement in this place at Kumototo. This was acknowledging the, the Manofina. When I say Manofina, the original people were actually in the site. So I, as I said before, middens could be shells, where there's a whole group of shells, sort of actually uh, just back where actually the settlement was. So what I did is I did these gigantic, um, huge uh, kinnas. I don't know what you call them here, or sea eggs. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're a delicacy for us, or like what you know in Japan. And basically, um, what I did is I supersized it because a majority of the people on this side, uh, where you can see the platform, actually eat at lunchtime. But what they do when they're having their fag or when they're having their food, they just biff it in the sea. So this is just the reminder, just and uh, I designed it so you could actually watch the tide going up and down. In between uh, those uh, those uh, giant tinner you know, uh, is like a mini hotel for the penguins. So I'm always thinking about the space and interacting with space. So this is at nighttime. Uh, so I sort of jumped from one genre to another. As I said before, I was when this technology, the American uh, America's Cup technology, was around. Uh, we are uh, used uh, what you call um, not a Dremel, um, it's like CNC uh, router at that time. That was the latest technology. So, what I did is I took the original shell from that area and basically we supersized it. This is when 3D technology was just on the beginning. So, I was, yeah, I didn't know really what I was doing, but basically, I had a good group of people around me with these engineers. This took over nine years. The reason why nine years because they um, put me through um, a hard time because I didn't want to put the skulls on that area. I wanted to put it in the sea. Now I love working with the tamariki because for me, my teachers um, backed me up. They knew I struggled with my art, and so uh, this is a performance piece that we did. We made these gigantic trout. Now trout don't come from NZ. Aotearoa. So what we did is we um, uh, made these uh, using recycled uh, fridges, made these gigantic uh, trout. Uh, this is at a school in a place called Taupo, which is in the center of Aotearoa. Uh, what we did is we um, uh, I taught them how to do graphene, and then I basically we filled it up with newspaper. Then also I didn't tell them uh, we filled it up with fireworks. We had thirty <laughs> of these beautiful trout all parked up in, in the lake. And basically what happened is when everyone went, oh, wow, they're so beautiful. And what, uh, but a couple of days before we started, I uh, took the, um, the tamariki through a uh, fire breathing exercise at school. So they learned how to do fire breathing. They weren't too, we knew what we were doing, uh, the tamariki and I, we just kept it amongst ourselves. So when the audience arrived, 
we set up the cameras all in different spots. And what I was trying to teach the Tamariki was not to copy from the books, but copy from their own images. This is the reason why I got to, into performance art, but also copying from ourselves. And so what we do is we um, lit up all the trout and they all disappeared. But at the same time, we had all these recording devices all around recording as they were being uh, destroyed. And from those images, what they basically did is they produced a whole beautiful series of woodcuts so that we could continue talking about this, uh, this trout, but it's not from Aotearoa. So I look for, I mean, I'm only skimming the surface. Um, another piece, um, we did these, uh, again, uh, these shells that used to be uh, like middens, like giant middens. This is a noosa. And um, it's, a, it's a bit of a sad story. Basically, what actually happened is when they put the highways uh, in, uh, in Noosa, they basically uh, put them right over the top of the middens and on Aboriginal land. And so what I did is I collaborated with the locals there, and we basically took the original shells, supersized them, and you know what I did, eh? And then filled them up, and we put them on top of the lake. And then we did a whole projection piece at night time, so it worked at night. This went on for about two weeks. And it was a response to the, actually the middens being removed of Aboriginal land, because this is the only evidence they can prove it was their land. And there was, in the distance was a, a massacre that actually happened in the background. So um, basically what actually happened, uh, four o'clock in the morning, I just burnt the whole lot. Because, um, and again, just to make getting everyone talking, because they wanted to actually take those pieces and put them in another festival. And I said, no, 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 it was for that area in particular, and acknowledged uh, to the Aboriginal and massacre that actually happened in that area and also the removal of the middens. The lome or the turtle, my mechanical turtle, and again, didn't know, where, didn't know too much about uh, um, uh, hydraulics or mechanical side of things, but basically I collaborated with uh, um, uh, Dominic Taylor from Weta, uh, this is in Wellington, and we built these uh, mechanical turtles that walk underwater. Inside, you can see there's um, a device where the, uh, the uh, Ear bottle goes inside a dye bottle uh, done by remote control. They're super realistic, but if you look carefully on the back, there's fish tins. Now, I spent on and off eight years up in the rainforest for a very good reason, because we were trying to stop all the deforestation that were going off in the Solomon Islands, right over in Melanesia. Uh, we did a paper making uh, project up there uh, using a bicycle. Uh, we built our own uh, jack press to um, uh, print our own prints. So our paper was banana and pineapp uh, pineapple. And what actually happened, I saw uh, a turtle parked up. And this is, uh, again, in the night Australian age, parked up a leatherback, a gigantic leatherback. And the reason why it was parked, well, it was actually it had passed because it had consumed, and you know what I'm going to say, but I'm not going to say it. And that actually had a devastation, you know, it sort of affected me. So as soon as I got home, I started making these gigantic mechanical turtles in response to what was going on, because there was a lot of interesting fishing practices coming from other countries who were helping themselves around the island. This is up in the Solomon Islands. So these were just another way to get the community to talk to each other. Oh, that's interesting, you're a mechanical turtle. But I wrote to these fish companies, and they basically sent these uh, pallets of these um, fish lids. And then I would make the, uh, it was uh, car tires, but everything is recycled and upcycled. Okay. So all the materials I use are recycled. Um, I, and not me, it's not just making it. There's a whole group of us nerds. No, he looks like him. It's probably his brother. <laughs> and again, basically, um, I made these uh, joking tuna in response because going up to Melanesia, I was overwhelmed when I flew back in from one of the islands uh, into into Henderson, and I saw this. I thought it was like it was almost like World War Two all over again. There was this massive fishing fleet, and I'm talking this is in the nineties. So for me, it was like uh, 
these fleets were just going around and they had a mothership parked up uh, in Honiara. So I was uh, doing these performance pieces, just trying to get everyone aware because of what was all these interesting fishing practices were going up in the um, up in Melanesia. It's not uh, inside that that actually uh, a fish smoker. We use these um, and again doing these performance pieces. This is a funnel orphi or a cannon, and I'll explain it as we go. So in Samoa, this is again history. Again, my mum used to. I um, oh, hope that's going. Um, in Samoa, uh, during the German times, when we were under German rule, uh, we had these uh, mass, uh, what do you call it, um, coming to work the plantations, the coconut plantations and the copper uh, copper plantations. And what they did is they, uh, the Chinese had brought this, uh, what we call a, a funnel off with this, we call it the Samoan firecracker. So my mum used to tell me all these stories about how she used to lose her eyebrow uh, when those, what they basically do, and please don't do it when you get home. Basically, what they do is they put kerosene in it, they heat it up in the bamboo, and you get two people on both sides blowing the, um, the, the fumes out, and you light up and you can hear it go bang. So, what I did is, well, as kids, because remember, some of us were born here in the NZ or well, in Aotearoa, so we only hear these stories from mum. This is going to happen. It hasn't closed. So, yeah. So again, I look for the community like to do these performances. And again, the art bits were just a vehicle to get everyone talking and a chance to actually bring our community out into the public because we have these little, um, and a lot of people actually didn't know we actually were, existed in the community and they were sort of just group us together. As you said, uh, the Cook Islanders, there's 15 islands. So they just think that we're just this, this one group and one language. So it was a chance for me to actually get our people out into the public and actually get, yeah, just empower the people like um, that we actually exist. Ah, uh, fly. Yeah, fly through the court. I did a lot of voluntary teaching. Um, the So I... Basically, I, I, uh, there was a club called the Monday Club. Uh, there was a whole group of gentlemen and musicians and artists. We'd uh, meet up only for one hour. We'd go to about three o'clock in the morning. And what we do is we'd take old footage and, footage and old photographs and we'd animate it. We'd crack codes. But what we do is we created uh, sound and music. So I... Um, and so basically what we did is we came up with these performance pieces and uh, what we did is we projected, this is what I'm um, sort of known for, like doing architectural projections with old school film and responding to the film with sound and the dance groups uh, from, our, uh, from our background. Now this is probably my most um, uh, favorite project called Transformer. Um, there was a place called Eads, uh, it's in Sydney, it's in a very hard area, and um, we have a huge meth problem. We have a huge suicide problem, and we have, um, so this is where art's actually really good. And so what they were trying, uh, they had asked me, because I've been doing a lot of work in this uh, particular area called Eads, it's, it's stuck in the middle of nowhere, and there's a prison there, a youth prison here, opposite the high school, a little play centre, the supermarket, so the kids are just set up there. It's an Aboriginal uh, prison uh, for the youth. So what they wanted me to do was come up with a concept to get these cars in the Georges River. There was like literally hundreds of these cars parked down the Georges River. And so they asked me, because they already knew what I could do with these um, bulls and all that sort of carry on. So I came up with a concept where we basically set up art stations from woodcutting, so it was a chance for them to help me design these big, gigantic um, sculptures using the cars. So on Monday, we do our DJing and projection. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, we do woodcutting and also designing to, so to help me design uh, the sculpture. And it was actually, it was a collaboration with, with the NCA, uh, the two shires from that area, um, the Aboriginal community, the Tarol, 
uh, the boxing club. So I had boxing as part of the program just to level up the young men. And um, so basically what we do, we train like twice a week, uh, 5.30 in the morning, we pick them up, we train, feed them, and then they would meet me at the R station. This was a program that went on, it took quite a while, and I was in Germany at this time, and they begged me to come back to work with this community. So this is Uncle Ivan. We had to do a smoke ceremony with all the cars that were down in the George's River. We wanted to do an extraction program. And the reason why, I went interviewing the locals, what did you want? I want you to remove all those cars. So what we did is we basically did an extraction program, we removed all the cars from down the river. And then what we basically did, <laughs> we parked them at the supermarket, just like your mache or your, uh, in the car park, in the middle with the cage right around it. And basically, uh, there was a pub across the road, and they we got in. Uh, the first night wasn't that great. Well, that first week, our, our tent got torched. Uh, we got attacked uh, within that in that first week. But once, I, this is my German side coming out. Uh, basically, what we did is we cut up all the cars, put them all in order, had a massive sound system playing all our music, and what the parents were doing was they were doing drive-bys going around. And they were dropping their kids off to be part of this project. Remember, I was running the boxing program at exactly the same time. Uh, as as the process went, the as the process went over the three months, we ended up with uh, this giant uh, bus, kangaroo bus. Now, under that, under the hoodie, there's a barbecue. A <laughs> lot. All my soldiers are functional. They have a function, just like our tower, you know, like the other bowl, you know, the, um, yeah, they all have a function. So I'm just using my background. And it was another way, because we parked it up at the school. They use this on special events when they use the barbecue. But again, <laughs> it was a collaboration with the community. So the youth, it was all about taking ownership back. And so what it did, and it didn't sort of break it down 100%, but they used, because they used to dump, you know, set the cars on fire, nip the cars from out of state, dump them in the river, we'd clean the river out, and we actually inherited rusty. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this guy is actually still sitting around, but this is in collaboration, again, with the Tangata Whenua, or Mana Whenua, you know, with the, uh, the local uh, Tarawal. That's been installed. You know, it was a, it was a really big deal. But and again, it was one of my proudest projects because it was an environmental piece, you know, acknowledgement like taking the river back because if the river's sick, the community's sick. And so we, when we ran these projects, and a lot of these kids ended up in the um, in the defence force because they had they didn't actually have fathers, so you come the token uncle, yeah. Now again. This is the beauty of these towers. Um, this is uh, this is the outcome like this exhibition. When you're giving like photographs, and I've been around these, I'm very familiar with this, this uh, these, some of these photographs here. Now, if you look carefully at the photograph, there's one of the um, the Samoan plantation with the coconut trees. If you ever fly into Samoa, look down. You know where the Germans have been because all the plantations are perfectly straight. So basically, this is um, a coin that I developed or created for the friendship treaty between Samoa and New Zealand. Now, we didn't have a really good relationship because, and again, these stamps that you see in this exhibition, a, a part of this show, we had the influenza, the, which, and again, our elders, a lot of our US, their information was wiped out. So the, a lot of the young men had to step up but did not know, couldn't recite um, the genealogy or how they own the land. So this, this piece was just talking about trying to rekindle or just get this relationship happen again between Aotearoa and New Zealand. Now, the reason why you see these cones, these cones were uh, the, what we call the or the wooden cones. Only, if you look at it, this is what I love about the photographs. These wooden cones only uh, existed during the German period. And for some weird reason, they disappeared. So what I did is when I was over in Germany, I was looking at these wooden cones was a response to like, 
how do I introduce the architecture? And then what I was doing was looking at the German architecture in Samoa. And then all of a sudden, um, the Samoa Royal Police brass band, uh, exactly at um, eight o'clock, they leave the government house to go do the flag raising. But if you listen very, very carefully, it's all German score. So I quickly ran down to the, <laughs> uh, went to the police station, went to look at their scorecards. So I came up with this idea where I thought, okay, this is interesting. Another way to open up the memory bank by using visuals, uh, using um, the cones, our traditional cones, but like combing through the history. So this is beautiful exhibition I collaborated with um, Hilke uh, in Munich for Samoa of Love, and she could see what I was actually trying to do. So we I basically, I was going backwards and forwards from Aotearoa to, to Germany with the Goethe Institute, going through all down in the bottom of the basement to these museums and documenting all the material that was collected, that was collected at that time. Our people, and a lot of people don't know this, a lot of Samoans were actually educated over in Germany before the First World War and then after the First World War. So these cones are sort of like a, just a metaphor. You know, we've been talking about metaphors for the last <laughs> few days. It's talking about combing through the history. So there are like little uh, visual diaries of the architecture, what was going on at that time in Samoa. And the reason why I had to produce so many, because I uh, collaborated with the, uh, the Samoan Police Brass Band, and we had a dance group with it, uh, basically, um, we, we were only supposed to have 10 dance, well, 30 turned up. So what I did is I censored a whole lot of these cones because all young Vahine uh, wanted actually their cones, so we basically got them to actually all wear those cones during the performance. As they were doing these performances, we um, did this mission around, this is in Samoa, this is on the old colonial building called the Courthouse. That's, this is one of the German buildings in Samoa in Apia, and I do these projections. So just down below here, we've got the Samoan Police Brass Band playing all the umpa music and also some of the old score from that time when we were under German rule. And the whole idea behind that for the elderly ones was just to open up their memory bank by looking at these visuals, these images, as they were playing it. And then when the next mission was, we went down to the other way. We're going down to several other villages. And what I was doing was mapping on the side of the churches. And I was just making out, I, was, I had to negotiate with the minister, just keep it on the quiet, because I know they pray at six o'clock exactly. Uh, we had the police would turn up. We're only allowed to do the performance. The, the village didn't know what was going on. The police, uh, the buses would turn up with the police, thinking it was a bus or something. They come out, their brass band music. We had the projection like, shoot up onto the, um, oh, like I mapped it up, I only had 15 minutes to, to map it out. All the music we are only allowed to play for one hour. And what the beautiful part about it is when we started playing some of the old school music from the German period and later, the old people started to sing to the building, these old images, as we've had the same experience with these photographs over here. Now, this is talking about, this is our first contact. This is, the, again, one of my famous um, projections that we did at a place called Te Papa in Wellington, or Te Whanganui Atara. Uh, they gave me the project too. So I wanted to get all the objects on first contact with Cookie when he first arrived. And basically, oh, yeah, cook, I'm a cat, you cook, or whatever you want to call him. And basically what I did is I, because we can't, don't have, our community doesn't have access to the collection, the Pacific collection or the Māori collection, what I did is I wanted to turn the museum inside out. And what we basically did is we filmed uh, all the artifacts. Um, there was a, a kuowo, a, a Māori flute in there. I got one of my colleagues to come in uh, to wake up the flute because it had not been played for 200 years. And then uh, the, inside the studio, uh, we negotiated with Mano Fino, with the Tangata Fino were there as well. And basically what we did, we built this huge uh, animation using the old drawings, uh, the artifacts, um, yeah, or any of the botanicals, the carvings from that period. 
And basically what we did is we turned the whole, it gave the impression the whole museum had been turned out inside out with all the drawers coming out. We had all this beautiful music that was composed. We had dance groups on the stage responding to the images. And basically what actually happened is, um, and this is the best part, is they took the, uh, I asked them if we could take the artifacts outside because the sound does not sound different in that space. It needs to be taken outside. So these artifacts with the white gloves were rolled onto the stage and then uh, they were passed on to my colleague, uh, Furumona, and basically it was played out in open air in response to the images. Um, I'm showing my age here, so just give, just give um, this is, Again, and I was. This is a, a beautiful project. It was uh, not celebrating, but the Anzac, and that was like the. I think it was the hun. I think it was the hundred years. We had to come up with um, some animation for the cenotaph that's in Fangamuatara uh, at Pukio, which is this um, war memorial in Wellington. And my colleagues uh, gave me the Pacific folder. And when I opened up the Pacific folder, I didn't realize that we had a whole lot of people serving from actually from here as well, who had joined up the, with Cook Island contingent uh, and as part of the Anzacs in the First World War. What we had to do, we had to find the names of the families. So what I did is I, uh, this is what I love about Facebook or Facebook or whatever you want to call it. We put the call out for these names because we wanted to project the names onto the cenotaph. And these, uh, then what actually happened, we got quite emotional. We uh, we got all these uh, photographs and we animated them onto the um, museum. This is in Buckle Street in Wellington. And the whole idea, again, uh, you could hear the families chatting because that was actually our, na our family name coming down there. We've never really been acknowledged, uh, acknowledged in our part in the First World War or the Second World War. So this is a chance for us because when we have Anzac Day, uh, this is in the last few years, we were never acknowledged. And for the first time, um, and this is the next part of the story, my wife and I went out to the Cook Islands and they talked about this conch shell. And we basically went around all the Cook Islands trying to find the soldiers and the families. And we created this project of where the kids, or the, no, sorry, the tamariki, could we uh, find the original gravestones of the soldiers that made it back, did make it back to uh, Rotonga. And basically what they did is they draw their name or they drew their, their family, um, their participation uh, as part of that campaign. So we interviewed the locals, these, all these war memorials all around uh, in the Cook Islands, but a lot of the younger generation don't know what they're there for. So basically what I did is I had to come up with a, a project and we do yeah, what we use this concert. The reason why I'm going on about this concert, because when I was teaching in a place called Rouen in France, uh, I got a phone call to go to a place called Arras. And in Arras, there's these tunnels. And part of the Māori uh, contingent uh, had three Cook Islanders. And one of the Cook Islanders actually had a conch shell. And he had left the conch shell inside the cave. And that came the beginning of that story. And basically what I did, I went back to Rotonga with uh, uh, basically, uh, this is Nick Hurley from the New Zealand High Commission who created this project. Thank you, Nick. And what I did was I collaborated with my uncle, Mike Tabioni and auntie. And again, this is where I, it was a community effort. So basically it wasn't just me, it was basically the community creating these pieces because uh, we wanted to use connect that story, that narrative about this conch shell that had been left in the tunnels in the First World War. And then basically what we had to do is we, because uh, there's a, uh, there's at the RSA, there's all these uh, soldiers that could not, the Cook Island soldiers that couldn't go back to their islands. Remember there's 15 islands. So a lot of them didn't make it back. So they were buried in the cemetery near the airport at uh, the RSA. And so what we did is we created these giant po. And I, my uncle and I, Mike Tavio, only had a disagreement because he's all, we didn't we have guns? He said, no, we, dunk, we dug the latrines. 
And um, we basically, we moved the artillery. So that's what we were responsible in the First World War. We were famous, it was the Rorotong contingent, but we were mixed in with the Māori battalion as well. So it's a narrative. So these are, remember, these are just vehicles to get them talking. And this is the finished piece. So you've got a conch shell in the background. I mean, I can expand it because there's so much here that, like today, I've been trying to figure out, oh, how do we sort of, where does this relate to you? But this is, remember I was saying, I'm only using my art and a wave uh, as a device to get everyone to talk to each other before we lose all our history. Is this Rotonga? Yeah, in Rotonga. And this rock here was actually from my village in Arang. This is a beautiful project again, uh, collaborating with uh, Mana Whenua. Uh, it's uh, called the Basket of Knowledge. And um, see the cable that's over there to the very right at the top? Um, I wanted to pull out the cable. This is in Otago at the, a place called Toro Heads. And I wanted to talk about the, the first um, settlement, but also the interaction with the Mana Whenua at that time. Basically, there was a cable was buried in the mountain where they dragged this um this gun because they thought um the russians were coming and so what i wanted to do was pull the cable out but then the historical side said no you can't do that and this is where i love technology so we basically took a 3d image just off that cable and i wanted to somehow how do we weave the community into the story into this narrative so again we came up with a 3d model And it's the, called the basket of knowledge. This is uh, so all those little diamonds represent the different iwi in Te Waipunamu, uh, what is Naitahu. That's the tribes or the different tribes all around the South Island. And the weaving system is called uh, pata, uh, Pataki, which is the flounder design, which was taken from the, the Marae. And again, collabor collaborating with Mana Whenua. And it's also that it was parked up in front, and it's now placed in front of the politic. And it's all about the students going to the politic to receive knowledge. And it's related to one of our uh, one of our stories. Now I was talking about this. Um, so what we were famous, the Cook Island contingent, and I'm not going off off story here. We were uh, there was a the Rorotong company or the, in the first world were famous with the British for moving the artillery, and that gave me that idea. Remember, I'm still talking about that conch shell. So when I was in Aras, when I went down to the tunnels to look for out that conch shell, this is on Armistice. I spent two days down there with uh, trying to look for this conch shell. Because I came out, I had to come up. There was, remember, there was about 17 different nations from the Pacific that had joined the, uh, the contingent to go to France in the first world war. So I had to come up with a way how do you not unite all these different nations from the South Pacific that were part of that campaign? So what I basically did is the, I was using the, um, the center of the artillery shell. This is our puppet that we use to celebrate on Anzac Day. Um, basically, uh, what we did is I incorporated each poppy represented the different nations from the South Pacific. Even Hawaii, we have a stone that's actually buried under that uh, the conch shell, the sculpture. So I had to come up with a, a, the conch shell or an idea. It was just because uh, there's a tunnel in one, a new tunnel called Aras, which is related to the Anzacs. So this is the concept. And basically, I had to sort of, and this took a couple of years. I got the, uh, and then sort of explained it to the community, got the community behind it. And this is it here today. So you remember, we've never been acknowledged, you know, on Anzac Day. So this is now out where we can actually go finally lament those ones who have actually served in all the different theatres. So now I'm going to, it's going to be 45 minutes exact. <laughs> so I am going to stop here. But thank you for just listening and looking and sharing my photo out.
forward to any questions uh, for Michael, and then we can check on my group and uh, have any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, and this is the most beautiful part. Um, like I, I have an elder called Darcy Nicholas, and in, early in my career, and my wife did Jane did ask, you know, does does it slow down? No, it just picks up, and as we yeah, you get to age, like things sort of just keep these, these amazing projects. And we're now being given these, as you see, uh, all the different genres that I'm using. And as you know, in Aotearoa, we've got film, um, we've got theatre, we've got uh, poetry, and actually even the piece, this, uh, piece that's actually here at this exhibition, um, collaborating with poets and creating these amazing architectural projections. So when you ask me what's the next project, yes, well, I'm working on three major projects at home, but I can't sort of really reveal it. But we're awfully busy. But what was so beautiful and sharing and departing with the Tamariki here, that it's not at all about just like being in a studio, just making just art, but it's also collaborating with engineers, scientists, mathematicians, and just giving them a chance to see, like looking at the bigger range, what is available, but how we can tell our our story using these all these beautiful mediums. Yeah. I'd be mm -hmm. asked this question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I get in, we get emails and messages like uh, left, right, and center. And I have to stay focused. I mean, this is the beauty of my wife. She keeps me focused. And I have a beautiful um, kumato or elder that I go to, Darcy Nicholas. And it's actually trying to slow down. It's my problem because there's so much to do. And like in the, in the last few days, these two and a half beautiful days was... Um, yeah, it was quite, actually quite an emotional um, workshop, but at the same time, it was empowering because the students that were telling me, oh, we learned a lot from you, but it actually it was the other way around. And then the luxury that we have is we've got this trauma from Lakma. You know, we can actually look at those as a, a way to tell our story. So, yeah, it just keeps going on. Hmm. 